But we begin tonight with writer E. Jean Carroll. Long before her name became synonymous with Donald Trump and her 1990s encounter with him in a New York City department store where he was found to have sexually abused her, she was known as a trailblazing journalist, a pioneer in the world of literary journalism. Her works have been published in countless magazines for decades. Readers took to her Ask E. Jean advice column to help solve their problems. She even hosted her own Ask E. Jean show on this very network's predecessor, America's Talking, in the mid-1990s. The biggest man handling trick of all is to know that there is no trick. All you have to remember is that you're a woman, and if you're a woman, you're precious. But like many victims of sexual abuse, she did not speak out about her encounter with Trump for a long time. And when she finally did in 2019, she says her life was forever changed. That is because for the past four years, she has had to endure defamatory attacks from Trump that she says derailed her career, wrecked her reputation, and threw her daily life into chaos. But don't take it from her. A federal jury agreed last year, finding Trump liable for both having sexually abused Carol in the 1990s and for defaming her in recent years. Now, remember, Carol is just one of more than two dozen women who have accused Trump of sexual misconduct. She is the only one thus far who has received her day in court. And today, for a second time, she took to the witness stand to reveal in detail what the relentless attacks from the former president and his followers, which she said sometimes amounted to hundreds a day and included graphic death threats, have done to her. The big difference this time around is that she did so with her attacker, Donald Trump, sitting just feet away from her in the courtroom, making this week the first time the two have been in the same room together in more than 25 years. And as you would expect with Trump, he brought the drama, causing disturbances during her testimony to the point where Judge Lewis Kaplan threatened to expel him from the courtroom. And he wasn't alone in causing problems. Trump's lawyer, Alina Haba, was also rebuked multiple times by the judge. And with a prior jury already having found Trump liable, the only question this jury has to decide is what Trump's defamatory comments while he was president and his continued attacks on her have cost her in terms of her career, her reputation, and her emotional distress. Joining me now is MSNBC legal analyst Lisa Rubin, who was inside the courtroom today, and Claire McCaskill, former senator from Missouri, Missouri uh, MSNBC political analyst and co-host of the How to Win 2024 podcast. Thank you, ladies, for being here. I do want to start with you, Lisa. Talk about the scene inside that courtroom today. You know, Joy, the scene inside that courtroom today was not for a shortage of fireworks. And every time Donald Trump comes to court, I think I've seen the last of his egregious behavior. And yet today we saw it again. Trump was clearly talking to Alina Haba in tones that were audible enough for the plaintiff's table to hear. And as E. Jean Carroll's lawyer, Sean Crowley, mentioned, if she could hear what he was saying, then surely the jury, which was even closer to him, right. could hear as well. And on a couple of occasions, he was essentially agreeing with his own prior statements when they showed video of Truth Social posts that he has posted, not only in the last couple of months, but even in the last week leading up to the Iowa caucuses, of him, again, denying the same story that a jury has already found credible, you could hear Trump say, that's true, or it was a disgrace. And he was admonished for that by Judge Lou Kaplan. The exchange between the two of them was an interesting study because Lou Kaplan does not suffer fools, and he has warned Trump, you have a right to be present here, but that doesn't mean that you can be disruptive. Right. And if you continue with this, I'll have no choice but to expel him, at which point Trump volunteered, I know that's what you want to do. And Judge Kaplan responded, sort of more in sorrow than in anger, you just can't help yourself under these circumstances. What I didn't hear, but what the Associated Press is reporting tonight, is that Trump then shot back, and neither can you. So wow. this is a person who remains wow. untamed. He did it again this afternoon. He was not admonished for it, and the plaintiff's counsel didn't bring it up. But when he comes back to court next week, and he is expected to return, mm -hmm. I, I would tell you I think Trump has one chance left with Lou Kaplan yeah. before he's removed from the courtroom and revoked 
that right to testify that Kaplan has offered him conditionally. What, what was E. Jean Carroll's demeanor when he was doing that? And what was her demeanor as she was testifying? And what did she testify to? So E. Jean Carroll's demeanor today, fortunately for her and for her side, was just as stoic and quietly graceful as it was during the first trial. If Donald Trump's presence was bothersome to her, you could not tell in her testimony. However, there was one point where she was on the verge of tears, where she was being asked to read a Twitter message that said in the most vile terms, basically, that she should kill herself. Wow. And she was on the verge of tears. And in contrast to his outburst when he heard something that he liked, former President Trump was totally unmoved by seeing a message where somebody said, essentially, that she should be raped and sexually assaulted, that she was too ugly for Trump to involve himself with, and that she should just go and kill herself wow. because she had brought this on herself. No reaction whatsoever from him. That, that does not surprise me, Claire, because that, that is who he is. You know, I just want to play very quickly a brief montage uh, of the way that Donald Trump has talked about some of his other accusers. She said I made inappropriate advances. And by the way, the area was a public area, people all over the place. Take a look. You take a look. Look at her. Look at her words. You tell me what you think. I don't think so. I don't think so. When you looked at that horrible woman last night, you said, I don't think so. Oh, I was with Donald Trump in 1980. I was sitting with him on an airplane. And he went after me on the plane. Yeah, I'm going to go after. Believe me, she would not be my first choice, that I can tell you. Man. You don't know. That would not be my first choice. And Claire, I I'm going to talk a little with you about politics because Donald Trump is using this as a political you know, set of stump speeches. He didn't have to be in this courtroom today. He, he didn't have to go, but he's going to make a point. And this is the reaction that he got when he did the Access Hollywood tape in which he wasn't giving a stump speech. He was admitting that he likes to sexually assault women. And here's one of his fans. This is a woman. And I saw these for myself with my own eyes in Cleveland during the convention uh, the year that he was nominated. And that is what she wore on her body, this one particular fan. Trump can grab my with a down arrow. Since his fans don't care, including some of his female fans, his supposedly Christian fans, that is why he behaves this way. But I'm just going to let you comment. Yeah. Um, first of all, I feel sorry for that woman in that picture. Um, I feel sorry for who she is and the life she's living. I really do. Um, and, and I think what everybody has to realize here, I do think he's going to get kicked out of the courtroom. I think he wants to get kicked out of the courtroom. This is a courtroom campaign. This is not a uh, retail campaign. He'll do a few rallies, but he made up his mind. And you can look, Joy, once he was indicted on paying off Stormy Daniels and hiding it in New York, his numbers went up. They bumped up. He was struggling a little bit. I mean, people forget there was a time when Ron DeSantis was polling ahead of him. And then he got indicted again, and they went up some more. And then he got it indicted again. His poll numbers have done a steady climb in terms of consolidating the Republican vote on the back of his indictments. He truly believes that the more he's in the courtroom, the more he's acting out, the more he is defying the deep state that's coming after him, the more the grievous gang that make up his supporters is going to be pleased and think that he's their guy. He's convinced them all it's all bull. He's convinced them all that he's taking this, these arrows for them because this is what the deep state does to people they don't like. And it has been effective for him so far. I will argue it won't be with swing voters. And it won't be with those voters in the Republican Party who have said clearly they'll never vote for him. So it's not like this is going to, I think, help him in the general election. Yeah. But maybe he's just not smart enough to see that. Right. And because his fans don't mind, his fans including female fans, women who would you would think would have some sort of self-regard and dignity, don't when it comes to him. I, I want to read just for, for the two of you some of the threats that were made against E. Jean Carroll, who, again, you know, she did a show on what used the, 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 pre the predecessor to this network. My late, wonderful um, friend Don Wormley was her stage manager, who used to be the stage manager for this show. Um, she did a show. But this is a woman who's lost all of 
you know, her sort of public profile because of things like this. I hope you die soon. I hope someone really does attack, rape, and murder you, one missive presented in court stated. Another simply said, rape Jean, rape Jean. Joy, one of the most effective moments in court today was one where no one was talking at all. They were asking E. Jean Carroll during the remnants of her direct examination, Robbie Kaplan, her lawyer, conducting it this morning, how she felt on reading some of these things. And these were a collection of threats. One of the things they did was have their trial technician Claire will know well that a good trial team has someone who can call up evidence really quickly for the jury and everybody else to see. The trial technician literally just did a scroll through some of these hateful messages. They weren't read aloud by Eugene or by anyone else. They were just there for the jurors and everyone present to look at and gawk at and digest. And I have to tell you, whether said aloud or just absorbed silently, the shock doesn't wear off that everyday Americans can be that vile in their speech. But I'll tell you one thing. The jury who last May found E. Jean Carroll's story credible, who said that she was both defamed and sexually assaulted, those jurors aren't the deep state. Right. They're ordinary people. They're not partisan hacks. Right. They don't get on the jury if they're partisan hacks. Right. Yeah. So they're not deep staters. And the thing I keep coming back to, to Claire's point about swing voters, is Judge Kaplan opened this trial by instructing prospective jurors here are the facts that you need to assume are true. A jury has found former President Trump liable for sexually assaulting E. Jean Carroll by forcibly inserting his fingers in her vagina. And I'm sorry that this is a family show, but I want to say to swing voters, that's the guy who's likely going to be the Republican nominee for president. Yeah. And that is a true fact found by a jury of his That's peers right. several months ago. That is your nominee. So you need to make a decision about whether you're going to stand with someone who's a sexually assaulter or not. Yeah, indeed. Today, Leonard Leo's conservative Supreme Court heard a major case that could potentially undermine the government's ability to make sure the air you breathe isn't polluted, the water around you isn't full of chemicals, or that we can have any basic gun regulations. The case, at first glance, is about New Jersey fishermen, but it's actually a larger, more nefarious network of groups like Coke Industries, gun manufacturers, e-cigarette companies, and the big farm industry who want to roll back a 40-year-old ruling that supports government regulatory power. What they really want is for the Supreme Court to reverse a 1984 decision that created something called the Chevron deference. That's a Supreme Court doctrine, which is now precedent, something this current court doesn't really care much for, where federal judges grant federal agencies latitude on how to interpret legislative statutes that are vague. Judges are supposed to follow a two-part process, examine the congressional language, and if the intent is clear, the matter is settled. If the language is ambiguous, the ruling court must defer to the agency on how the law should be carried out. That makes sense, right? The court says, let's defer to the experts on pollution, banking, or the FDA. But that's exactly why big business hates it. They don't like regulation. They don't want to put in place costly protections because why waste money making sure you're not drinking poison when they can make more money not caring about whether you're drinking poison? And based on what we heard today, the anti-regulation argument seemed to fly with the majority of Supreme Court justices, including the man seemingly hired to kill Chevron, Judge Neil, Justice Neil Gorsuch. Gorsuch, who is the son of Ronald Reagan's EPA administrator, who worked to slash air and water quality regulations, has said that Chevron deserves a tombstone. Justices Alito, Kavanaugh, and Thomas seem to share that sentiment in arguments today. Joining me now is Ellie Mistal, Justice Correspondent for the Nation. How the arguments go today? Yeah, they were bad, Joy. <laughs> um, to be very clear, what this case is about is power. Right. Because Congress is going to write a law. They're going to be gaps because Congress is making political deals and also generally incompetent. Right. So who gets to fill in the gaps the way it is right now and the way it's been for the past 40 years? Experts get to fill in the gaps. People who know things get to fill in the gaps. Science and math and facts get to fill in the gaps. Can't have that. What the conservatives want is to take that power away from the president, away from the executive agencies, and give it to themselves. So there will still be regulation after this case. It's just that Neil Gorsuch gets to decide how much mercury is, is, is allowed to be in the air. And John Roberts gets to decide how many people can die in a thresher mill accident before we 
we declare it un unsafe. And Brett Kavanaugh gets to decide what banking regulations really should matter. So it's really the biggest, and I've said this before, this case represents the biggest Supreme Court power grab, taking power away from the people and giving it to themselves since 1803, since Marbury v. Madison. And the thing is, they were hired for this purpose. I want to play for you. This is Don McGahn. Don McGahn. This is Trump's former White House counsel saying that they actually looked for judges who would deregulate, which is why they picked Neil Gorsuch. Take a listen. There's a uh, major effort in the Trump administration, coherent and strategic and articulated, to try to do something about reining in the regulatory state. And Justice Gorsuch is an expert on those kinds of issues and the Chevron doctrine. T t talk about that. Well, it's not a coincidence. Uh, it's a part of a larger, a larger plan, I suppose. There is a coherent plan here where actually the judicial selection and the, and, the rate and the deregulatory effort are really the flip side of the same coin. I think what really infuriates people, including myself, is that this is not jurisprudence. This is not them finding something, looking at the Constitution and seeing what the law is. It's a setup. They want to deregulate. They wanted to get rid of abortion rights. They want to get rid of voting rights. They just want to roll back the 20th century. It feels very systematic. So now we got to talk about Neil Gorsuch's mama. Yeah. Because as you pointed out, she was Reagan's head for the EPA. But was she one of these people who wanted to make the EPA succeed? No. She wanted to destroy the EPA from the inside. And this case that we're talking about was actually the government, the judges, the liberal judges, giving her leeway to destroy the EPA from the inside. But it didn't work because, see, back in 1984, conservatives thought that they were more likely to hold the presidency right. than the Supreme Court. Roll it forward 40 years. And Neil Gorsuch, the Nepo baby that he is, is continuing the family business of destroying the EPA. But he realizes that unlike his mama, he can't be voted out. Yeah. His people can't be stopped, right? He has lifetime power, and this is part of the general conservative movement. They understand that judges hold lifetime power and are not subject to the whim of the people. And so destroying the regulatory state through judges yeah. is now preferable for conservatives as opposed to trying to win their arguments at the ballot box where they often fail. I mean, this is the reason that the idea of expanding the court is starting to catch on, even with people who originally opposed it, because these these guys have a political agenda and in ending regulation other than the regulation they impose themselves, ending women's rights, ending women's rights to an abortion, ending civil rights, just basically rolling back the entire 20th century Supreme Court jurisprudence. They're doing it so systematically that they're not stoppable if you don't expand the court. At this point, the difference between a progressive justice and a liberal justice versus a conservative or Republican justice is that the liberals believe in facts and the conservatives believe in vibes. <laughs> and they are vibing out right now. They are winning on the vibes and remaking the law back in their image of the 1950s and the 1850s. Yeah, how long till they get to Brown v. Board or the or the case where it said that, you know, uh, segregation schools can't get the tax cuts? Because yeah. that was what they were. It's on Clarence Thomas's list. As long as you leave Jenny alone, Clarence yeah. Thomas is interested in yeah, he that He don't mess with interracial marriage. He right. don't keep that one because that's his own family. Um, what do you think? This is, does this look like a 6-3 or 5-4? Because this, this is going. This the, is gone. Leonard Leo has bought this. He's purchased it. This is what he bought and paid for, and this is what they're going to do. I do think it's going to be a 6-3. There was some, there's something with Roberts where he might do the thing where he overturns it without saying he's overturning it, God. but this is, this is going to be bad. El Ellie Mistal, thank you. Don't climb a ladder after this, because if, if Neil Gorsuch didn't say they could be regulated, you're going to fall. Uh, thank you very much.